Well, welcome to the fall term of 2024 personal finance. Uh, I'm Jim Parker, and uh, I'll be obviously your instructor for this term. Uh, personal finance kind of an interesting course, especially uh, right now. It's kind of interesting times. We'll, we'll we'll talk about everything that's kind of going on and, and stuff. It's um, there, there's a lot a lot of things, politics and other stuff that affects personal finance, and and there's a lot of turbulence out there, but. Um, basic principles though will, will guide you to to uh, give you basically the resilience to uh, to endure you know your financial future and and uh, end up with with uh, wealth being something that's going to be able to help you uh, you know mitigate and, and enjoy and thrive whereas uh, if you have some poor habits um, you know we'll, we'll discuss some ways to, to work around that to get that corrected while uh, before they have a huge impact on your on your life uh, anyway we're just starting to get deep right off um, syllabus I'll, I'll go through the syllabus and then I'll jump right into the first chapter so the way this is going to work is um, we'll, we'll try and do some some live lectures uh, once the course gets going but initially um, because you know people take distance education for uh, a reason typically because their schedule doesn't allow set meeting time, so it kind of defeats the purpose to come up with hard and fast times. Um, but we can work around that. Um, I use YouTube. You know, it's I know it's annoying for some of you, but, you know, I have a subscription, so I don't see all the commercials and stuff. My apologies for, for you all. But, um, you know, obviously it's owned by Google and the, you know, good and bad um, Google does have pretty good technology in terms of bandwidth and the rest of it. So it's not so glitchy in terms of the lectures and, and the ease of getting to them. So th the typical thing will be the lecture will be put out early in the week. Uh, there'll be some homework associated with it. The homework, again, kind of uh, keeping in with the theme of the distance education, the homework will not be turned in weekly. It, there will be homework assigned weekly but the homework will be turned in a batch assignment prior to prior to the exam. I'll cover that again in the syllabus and some other things. A couple exams uh, on Blackboard, so again, try and facilitate that. I, I'm looking at these pictures realizing I need to change some things out at some point. My life hasn't changed that much, but, uh, you know, some of these dogs are older, and, and uh, this poor girl passed away a bit ago. This was uh, Buddha. Great, great dog. Um, I, I, I raise Hungarian Vizlas and horses and pigs and whatever. I, I do more farming than I do anything else now. Primarily for, for whatever to control land and just for personal enjoyment. But, but anyway, so and I spent a lot of time in Europe. So I got accustomed to uh, Hungarian Vizlas and brought one back with me. And I've gone back to Budapest and places like that to get other dogs. Quarter horses. I've always raised quarter horses. My daughters, I've got two of them. One just graduated from nursing school, uh, her second bachelor's. And my other daughter, go figure, she is um, on scholarship down to Oklahoma State. Uh, she's in her final year uh, riding uh, barrels on, the, on their rodeo team. And uh, I guess she's going to... Uh, University of Wyoming for grad school also to ride rodeo. So this is where I live. Um, it's kind of funny. I, I wanted a big chunk of property, and I wanted access to the Connect River because the, the riding on it's pretty good. Um, but unfortunately, this jackass of a horse right here, he threw me in the river, so my shoulder is completely jacked up right now, probably requiring surgery. Uh, I used to run a campground on it to kind of get this part under control if you guys are familiar with the area this is the Kinnick River Kinnick River Bridge the Butte uh, anyway it's kind of a lawless kind of area and uh, I turned it into a campground but that kind of ran its course now I'm, I'm just kind of running it as a farm and and doing other stuff with it we'll we'll do something more with it but it was a little you know real nice property um, my old Tamworth now I'm raising Idaho pasture pigs different type of pig here's one of my pigs standing in the water I've had cattle, but cattle don't make much sense to raise them up here. And pheasant as well. I raise a lot more ducks than I do pheasant now. Anyway, 
And the dogs are kind of an ever-present thing. This is, uh, I, I get some stuff from the food bank now and then. This particular little little pig piglet was eating some birthday cake. So, anyway, um, me, I've, I've got a, uh, I was in the military. So, yeah, I, I'm not that old, but I was in the F4. Just barely. That's me in the back seat. This guy's a major general now. But way, way back in the day, I got the tail end of the F-4 just as Desert Storm was happening. And then I was flying Strike Eagles. This is a an old warbird that I've got, but it's actually in pieces right now. But actually, it's funny enough, the Ukrainians are actually flying these things again, shooting down drones with them. So it's truly a warbird now. It's kind of cool. Um... But anyway, because I was in the military, uh, you know, I flew for the first half of my career. The second half, I got more into business-related stuff. And so, accordingly, I got an MBA. And then uh, when I was overseas, I actually uh, worked on and picked up my PhD. I worked for a defense contractor, which is, you know, it's an interesting experience. This total, totally corporate world, you know, completely soul-crushing experience to work for those kind of folks. I, I enjoyed my work. The stuff I was doing, though, was, was pretty interesting work. But for the rest of it, working in a corporate uh, structure, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of us will end up doing. But, um, yeah, the day that I, I no longer will work for anybody else, I guess I'm actually working for the university. But, but in terms of a corporate employer, that, that ship has sailed, thankfully, in my life. So, anyway, I did sell real estate a little bit. That's kind of a... It's not something you want to do necessarily part-time, although that's the way it's kind of done by a lot of people. And uh, you just never quite reach critical mass. So um, something had to go. And so I had a bunch of side hustles going. I still had this job. I was teaching full-time at the university. And finally, uh, it just became too much, so I gave up on the real estate. My business experience within the military, we were doing some creative stuff back in the day. Um, I was in Europe. I, I lived in Europe, I don't know, 14 years all in. I still got a house in Germany, as a matter of fact, but I think we're selling that and going to get a place in Belize. But, but anyway, it's neither here nor there. But, but the, uh, um, the folks with NAMSA, anyway, is a supply thing out of, under NATO down in Luxembourg. And I'd go down to Luxembourg quite a bit. And uh, our, our deal was to uh, transfer these helicopters from... Uh, many of the Eastern European nations who needed money to, to uh, Afghanis and, and the donors who were paying for this stuff back in the day. And, and so you got involved in a lot of business deals that were, you know, not, not too dissimilar than, than business deals I'd work on in later parts of my career, but it was just under a lot more exciting kind of conditions. Um, my campground and the farming thing, it's, it's still titled Kinnick River Ranch. Um, I didn't really <laughs> necessarily want to have my name associated with the campground. I'm not too far from, from Jim Creek and some things happen out, out of those places that uh, I don't necessarily want to be associated with. But, but now, um, my place is pretty squared away. In fact, uh, this current place is it's just short of 100 acres. And I just bought a new place, another place on the Kinnick, and it's 338 acres. It actually has frontage on both the Matanuska and the Connect. So anyway, I like real estate to, to uh, well, for farming, but also there's loan structures you can get with it and the rest of it too. It's good to be a farmer when, when you're working on those kinds of, of deals and the animals I raise are, are definitely pleasant. So it works on. Uh, this was the uh, original thing. It was an old homestead that I purchased. This was the river down here. I don't have too many details on the new piece. Maybe it'll come up at some point in the course. But anyway, so I've done a lot of different types of real estate transactions. This thing was actually, I had to split it up into three chunks just to buy it. And, uh, you know, there, there's, if you're smart and you're ready to, to move on things, you can, you can do well um, in terms of whatever. When I bought this thing, they thought it was only 78 acres. It actually was, this whole chunk in here was actually... Uh, had it been added by the bridge that was existing here. So you have erosion on the other side. And on this side of the river, you had accretion, which means and land was added. So ends up being a bigger chunk. Um, easy come, easy go. When you're living on a river, you, you can get some flooding. You can get some other things. But you also have some beautiful views. Pioneer Peak is right, I mean, a stone's throw from here. Okay, so 
the goal of this course, you know, enough about my kind of stuff. What what you need to realize is getting into personal finance is is wherever your station is in life, um, you need to kind of think outside of of where you're at. You know, the, the the kind of the rule or the the understanding is that you know the poor people spend, the uh, middle class they save, and the rich people invest. And and so, you know, if you're not making a whole lot of money, you end up spending basically everything you got just to survive. And then the middle class usually gets kind of wrapped up with working and everything else. And so they just kind of squirrel away their money and they, they save what they can, but it may not go quite as far. They may not quite end up with as much at the end of their their working career as, as the wealthy whose wealth tends to just go up and up exponentially. And so this is really apparent now that, you know, the, the, the poor have gotten poorer, the richer have gotten richer, and the middle class is sort of disappearing. So how do you get around that? Well, there, there are ways in terms of investing. And, you know, in this case, what we're looking at, and I'll have these examples in your, in your uh, I'll post them to, to Blackboard. But uh, this is not rocket science, but what it explains is compound interest. And compound interest is, some of you may be familiar with it, some may not, but when you're earning interest on interest, you, you can make a tremendous amount of money. So we'll, we'll cover a lot of broad topics here, but I really wanna hit this um, bit about compound interest from, from day one. What happens when you start earning interest on interest? Like, let's say somebody's gonna borrow you know, $1,000 from you and they're gonna pay you 10% simple interest. Well, a year from now, they would give you, you know, your $1,000 plus $100 back. That would be $100 of simple interest. If they were compounding it, what they would do, there's a little bit more math involved, but obviously, you know, computers, technology can hack this, but what, the, what they do on compounding interest is they would get that 10% that they're gonna pay you over the course of a year, and they would split that up into essentially a daily rate. So each day you would not get 10%, you would get 1 365th of 10%. And so on day one, you would have $1,000. On day two, you would have $1,000 plus the interest you earned on day one. And so it may not seem like a big deal, and it might not be a big deal after a year, but the fact that you're earning interest on interest would mean, say at the end of the year, um, if, you're, if your interest was compounded daily, rather than have you know $1,100, your original thousand plus 100, you might have something like you know, 1180 or something. You would, you would have more interest because you were earning interest on interest. Well, if you extrapolate that over time, and especially over a human life, over your working career, those numbers become phenomenal. So anyway, that's what this chart ahead of you. It's, I, I realize this is an eye test. You don't have to study these numbers right now or anything like that, but, but we're gonna use it as an example to explain compound interest. So let me just read some of the titles to you. So a Roth IRA, that's, we'll talk more about that. That's just an individual retirement account. And the thing about a Roth, it means that you put the money in into this account after the taxes were paid on it. Um, a Roth account, um, by using money that's already been taxed, when you go to withdraw that money, um, since the money was taxed before it was put in, it's not taxed uh, when you when you withdraw it, which can be huge depending on how much interest you got on it. So we'll talk way more. The, the intent here is not to explain Roth IRAs, but we're just looking at a sum of money that in this particular case is going to be held in a Roth IRA, and it's going to go up by 5% uh, per year, but it's going to be compounded. And so this... Excel spreadsheet spreadsheet was just set up to, to show somebody's age, uh, how much money um, they you know put in, and 
the value if if well actually yeah this was at age 18 here's the investment um, we'll explain more about that later uh, this is the value at age 65 uh, ROI return on investment and then cost of delay it doesn't seem very significant let's say you know you're you're a college student which is a good investment don't get me wrong but you know let's say your college student takes out a bunch of loans and you're kind of living it up a little bit maybe more than you should and now um, you're having to pay off these student loans before you can start investing so you know rather than start investing right out of college you're delaying because you're going to pay off these student loans first so now you're not even starting to you know invest till you're in your 30s well by delaying um, it's going to cost you something over that period so anyway um, we'll, we'll go through that um, as you know you'll have some time uh, to look through these charts later and, and you'll have the raw spreadsheets so anyway what I'm trying to show here though is I'm trying to show uh, the power of compound interest so that first one was five percent this one's eight percent and then we'll concentrate here on ten percent ten percent is kind of a unique number because that's typically what the stock market and you know when I say the stock market you know we're talking equities purchasing uh, uh, you know investing in companies um, overall the, the broader stock market pretty much has earned about 10 percent you know on the whole on average uh, since whatever the turn of, of last century so in the long term it's gotten to uh, return turn that amount of money so what I'm trying to show here is is just how a small amount of money can generate a huge huge um, income at the end of the day or a, whatever a nest egg at the end of the day so down here in bold uh, it talks about the age at which you start contributing 5500 per year which is about $500 a month um, you know skipping one month so skipping you know December because of Christmas or whatever and then putting it a little bit more from 50 to 65 but anyway so we're not talking huge amounts a month you know we're talking it could be fairly significant when you when you're first starting out put five five hundred dollars in but because that money is going to have such a long time compounding that is the money that's really going to generate the wealth um, because it's it's in there for for so so long uh, generating that wealth so I've gone through this huge explanation to kind of explain that you know just just kind of let you try and get your your mind around the fact that if you spend five hundred dollars per month set aside five hundred dollars per month just you know pretend like it's a a bill or whatever and set that aside for investing every month and put it in a quality investment how much money you will end up with by the time you hit retirement age and most people guess oh yeah it's gonna be quite a bit of money but they're thinking in the thousands and anyway then the numbers are so much higher you would have 5.3 million dollars I mean you would be essentially a millionaire five times over and your return on investment would not be that simple 10% all in the return on investment over the course of that um, investment would be damn near 2000% so that's why I'm trying to emphasize compound interest from from day one you know again you can you can put people into different groups um, as you go through your financial career and and you know there's people who earn interest and there's people who pay interest uh, people who you know generally drive in new cars and have tons of credit card debt and all the rest of that they're probably the people that can't afford to put away that five hundred dollars every month and they're going to be paying a lot of interest through you know through their life and is the quality of life going to be that much better um, you know later on in life once you get more established and um, you don't have to worry about 
that time value of money because you're getting older. It's, you, you can not feel as guilty, you know. Uh, you know, let's say you're making ten grand a month and you're only putting five hundred in the savings. You can you can be fine with that because you contributed so much early on, and now you can have the new car and the new this and and you know whatever uh, saving for kind of a rainy day. Also. If you adopt a model like this and have a dis disciplined saving strategy, you will also uh, be able to, um, you know, avoid some of the pitfalls of running your personal finances down to the very limit where you're where you're struggling or, you know, you got some crappy job, you don't want it, you want to move somewhere, you want to do something, but you can't because you've got payments and you can't quit that job. You know, you're essentially job locked, or you're having, you know, sleepless nights because you don't have money set aside. And uh, just because if you if you have money, even if it's a retirement account, because there are penalties for pulling money out of retirement accounts before you hit age 59 and a half. But if there's a hardship, if there's a medical thing, or, or even sometimes like first time home buyers, they'll they'll allow you to do it as well, where you can pull that money out and. Uh, I've always taken loans against my retirement accounts for anything. You don't, you're not getting a loan from a bank. You don't have to justify anything. Uh, you take up to $50,000, use it for what you want, and you pay it back to yourself, basically. And the interest goes, goes to you. So, Anyway, the, the whole key with personal finances is to not you know, become this Scrooge McDuck type you know, miser who's obsessed with money but to to have your personal finances in order to where you don't have to focus on money you can live your life you can do the things you want and your <clears throat> finances are not the you know thing that's driving your every decision because you've made previous bad decisions hopefully you've made some good decisions that give you give you the liberty to do it um yeah, so here's some of these numbers again, just to blow up. You can get a look at that chart, but yeah, if if somebody started age 18, I, I realize for most of us that ship has sailed. I'm no longer 18. I don't think most of you are, but if you were able to, you know, and you started doing that, uh, you could generate immense, immense wealth. So, uh. This is something else I just sort of wanted to add. When we're talking about personal finances, especially in a in a you know election year, people get kind of confused and they think, oh man, this you know times are hard and they there's a there's a lot of I don't know I don't well I, you kind of have to use the word propaganda and I'm talking on both sides where where you know everybody's toughing it out right now. <laughs> not everybody, you know, these are basically, and they come from all sides of the politics. Um, this is what happened to their net worth uh, through COVID. So it's, it's a bit scary. You know, I'm not saying people are incentivized to have another COVID type epidemic, but it, it certainly worked out pretty well for, for a few folks. So, um, don't be, uh, I, I'm just saying, it is, you know, what you want to do is you want to end up uh, resilient. You want to end up where you're not tied to one or other political side in terms of your finances. And also don't take things too seriously in terms of the drastic consequences that are forecast on both sides in case things, you know, go horribly wrong. As you can see that by that previous slide, um, in times of adversity, there are financial strategies that that do work. And it, it gets pretty ugly. You know, ugly in terms of, of uh, where we should be in terms of human beings. But, you know, financially, I've, I'm in a different situation than you all. I'm a, I'm a boomer now. So, you know, if we're in endless wars, I've, I've pretty much been there, done that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get drafted anytime soon. 
I've got income that's indexed to inflation. So if, you know, and spending continues the way it is and, and the wheels come off the bus, uh, you know, it's sad that, that anyway, things have, have worked out like that. And also, I, I'm fairly big in crypto. I, I bought my first Bitcoin. Oh, I only bought two of them back then, but um, I bought them for 700 bucks a piece. And, and so, you know, your generation, as you make some YOLO move into, into crypto, that's going to obviously in, inflate the value of crypto. And, and crypto could have some positive benefits. So, um, you know, I don't think it's too horrible of me to, to hope that, that Bitcoin and, and some of the other you know, Ethereum, Solana, some of those um, get get bigger. So we'll talk a little about crypto too. So not not everything's as boring as it seems, and and there are definitely uh, some some ways to get around it. Um, you know, and anyway, we'll talk more about things as we as we go. Um, this is the book is is Maduro, which is a personal finance book. In fact. Let me jump to that right now. I'm going to run through the syllabus just to give you kind of an overview. This is already posted to the Blackboard. Um, so the course information, my name, contact information, a little about the course. Um, you can read this at your leisure. Uh, homework. So homework, again, will be turned into batch assignments, one before each exam. Midterm and the final are the two graded events, or, you know, whatever, multiple choice graded events. Participation, participation on a distance course. Obviously, you know, trying to figure out how that's done. What we do is, is there's videos like this that are not, you don't have to critique these or give me your thoughts or any of that. that this is a lecture video. But there's other videos by third parties that I'll put out there every week that, kind of touch on the concepts and you by commenting on these extra videos um, that will suffice as your participation so you know you're expected to kind of engage weekly and and look at the slides you know and then look at the little um, extra video and then make your comments and go yeah this is completely off base or this is completely useful or or whatever your thoughts not a essay, not a anything. We're talking like a sentence, like, yeah, I agree with what he said, you know, or she said, or whatever. Um, but it's just to, you know, make sure, sort of a pulse check out there. The term project, people hate this, and, and please don't use a bunch of chat GPT. We could all do that. It's not going to do anything for you, and it's so transparent. My daughter, one of my daughters, wrote this excellent letter, she thought, and, and it was like totally chat GBT, because it's like, why say in, you know, five words that you can say in five paragraphs? It's just so annoying that the way it just kind of, and people think, wow, this is well done. No, it's not. Uh -uh. I mean, granted, garbage in, garbage out. And there's different models and stuff, but, but um, anyway, um, and as most of you know, there's really no way for an instructor to tell whether that's being used or not. And to tell you the truth, I don't care because what you would have to put in in the parameters and chat GPT to get a useful product would essentially, uh, you know, show your, demonstrate your knowledge of personal finance. Because the personal finance project, it's not, uh, what people want is, I want exactly this term project. Nope, it's not that easy. Your personal, your term project is, is based upon your financial plan. And so since every one of us is different, everybody's plan is going to be different. And I'll even get people who are like maybe from another country or some super unusual situation and they want to do something totally different, which is fine. The, the utility of this project is A, to provide, you know, a, sort of a gradable event, but more importantly, something you can use in your life. So the project itself is, is sort of how you're going to solve your, your financial situation, how you are going to set up yourself in terms of personal finance to keep yourself from being, 
I don't want to use the term unburdened, but it's so overused right now. But uh, not not just hyper focused on on day to day personal finance issues. You know, you want to be the kind of person who's you know 35, 40 years old, had a bit of a career, and said, yeah, this just isn't working out. I don't work like where my life is going. I'm going to move to whatever country, and and I've got enough finances to get me by for three to six months to three to six years and and I'm good and I'm, I've got that sort of freedom and uh, I'm going to do what I want and what's best for me and my family if there's a family involved and, and I'm just going to do it and I'm not working from paycheck to paycheck because I've made a series of bad decisions that have left me in a thing where I'm a you know sort of a wage slave to to you know some evil corporation somewhere um, so anyway um, to, to make it useful though, if you're in college, you know, there's no guilt to, to necessarily not having a, a, you know, major job or whatever on the side to, to make sure you don't go in any kind of debt. Um, no, if you're a student, you should be concentrating on, on being a student and, and, you know, building up your skills and investing in yourself and, you know, for me and, and what I've tried to do for my kids is go to, you know, some place where, where they can focus on that. You know, they were actually able to go to, you know, college towns where, where that was the main focus. But if you're not able to, at least, you know, try to focus on, on your studies rather than, um, you know, jobs and stuff that are, uh, you got plenty of time for that in life. You got plenty of time to, to work. So anyway, that being said, for, for a traditional college student to come up with some comprehensive financial plan starting from, you know, the day they're in college is going to be kind of meaningless. For those kind of people, you should probably advance yourself about, you know, five years or so until you're actually, you know, immersed in your career and, and that's what you're going to do. And now you're st- taking home a steady paycheck and, and you're, you know, putting money aside. And well, I've already touched on it a little bit, but this concept of, of paying yourself first. You know, you've got certain bills each month that need to be paid. The rent, you know, your phone, the other stuff. Well, investing should be one of those bills. You should set some sort of goal, perhaps 10%, 15%, something like that, and saying, this is what I'm going to do every month. This is a bill. And before I start, you know, wasting money on on wants I, I need to get my needs taken care of and so anyway um, this paper though is going to be super individualized for for every person now if you're somebody who's you know perhaps mid-career or perhaps already you know was was in a career and came back to school and has, has continued with that job um, what I just said is not going to apply to you it, it, you, you would probably start your plan from from right now since you're already in your in your financial situation and you're already bringing in enough enough money to make you know uh, realistic and, and relevant and, and significant um, investments in uh, in your finances um, yeah the danger of student loans try not to overdo that if you can uh, Social Security We'll talk about retirement plans, but a lot of times people think that, oh, I've got Social Security. We'll talk about how that's probably not a good, good thing. That's almost turning into a welfare program, which is sad because you're actually paying into it. But what it's going to be turned into by the time you guys get to retirement age is it's not pretty. Life insurance, when do you need it, when do you don't? What's the point of it? Um, investments, we'll talk about different types of investments, you know, and what's realistic. With any investment, you've got inflation that's ticking along. And uh, obviously, inflation is is quite high. And it's probably a bit higher than they're telling you as well because, you know, people are incentivized to lie to you a little bit, maybe a lot, because, um, you know, the government has huge debts. So if the government has high interest rates, not only does it look like, you know, politically, that's not a good situation. But also, since the government has to pay interest on its own debt and has people that are, you know, driving 
benefits or retirements that are indexed to inflation, uh, it's to the government's advantage to uh, perhaps understate that. Uh, career field, what are you going to do? You know, and I'm. We'll, we'll talk more about this, but but you know there are some careers that pay quite well, but may not have the quality of life you're looking for. And so if you choose another career that doesn't pay that well, you know, you're going to have to be a bit more disciplined and smarter about your money to keep that same sort of lifestyle. And I'm not saying not to make that, you know, choice, but just realize um, what, you're, what you're getting in on. There's some books, you know, the, the Wealthy Barber and some other people who have basically had sort of, you know, not super high paying careers but have done quite, quite well because they, you know, get involved uh, in investing almost to the point of like a hobby level where they're making outsized gains. If you're in the military, a whole different route um, for that. And then tax deferred type things. Um, we'll talk a lot about this. 401ks, 403bs, thrift savings plans for military people. Anyway, these plans are going to be your plan is four to five pages because literally in less than that you can't really address uh, what your plan is going to be like and we'll go over this more and more as we go through the uh, through the course uh, homework we'll, we'll talk about this each week weekly lectures what's going to be covered testing stocks we'll take Thanksgiving week off we'll have a prep the, the tests themselves are not going to be that, I, I don't think they're that difficult, not if you're, you know, watching the lectures. I, I review uh, the, what's going to be required in the exam the week before. Now, I don't give you the answers, but I definitely uh, focus in on what the important bits are. So, um, if you pay attention, and I think you'll do just fine. Um, students do do pretty well in this course. More of the syllabus, and that's it. So anyway, that's already posted at Blackboard, so you can take a look at that. Um, back to personal finances itself. So, chapter one, yeah, we will go through, you know, try and stay with the, the textbook to a, to a certain degree. Um, but this financial plan is essentially going to be this, this term paper. That's where your plan is going to come up. Aspire from. Uh, process of spending, financing, investing to optimize your financial situation. A big key item in this, and, and super emphasized on the test, if you don't understand the concept of opportunity cost, it's just going to beat you up, um, not only on the midterm, also on the final and in life. You know, opportunity cost means if you're doing one thing with your time or money, you're not doing another, you know. If you're, um, you know, spending whatever amount a pack of cigarettes costs right now, and you're not investing that money. If you're, you know, getting a, a you know, overly sweet milkshake type thing from Starbucks right now, you're, you're not investing that money. So you can tell that I'm kind of, Tried to modify your behavior a little bit. A lot of these things that, that you would spend your money on are, are not things that are going to um, be necessarily good for you. Or, again, uh, I will highlight a fair amount about new cars. Just there's, there's nothing that can destroy a person's financial you know, future more than... than you know, vehicles, because there's so many ways that, that they basically kind of get you and that you can, you can do reasonably well by having a car that's, say, maybe two, three years old rather than brand new, and, and at the end of the day, your finances will be dramatically different. I realize, yeah, we're, we're here in Alaska, you may have young kids, you don't necessarily want to be driving, driving an old beater around on a cold winter day, but... There is a fine line between, you know, what you need and, and what you want. So try to strive for that. 
So everything has an opportunity cost. Everything in life has an opportunity cost. You know, time, money, all these things. If you're doing something, you're not doing something else. You can tell I raised dogs here. Right now they're outside. Good on them. We had a litter here uh, oh, back 15th of June. So I, I raised uh, these Vizlas that are uh, um, bird dogs. So super high strung. And uh, a few of them are still going home to their families. But anyway, they're they're uh, pretty incredible dogs. But if you hear something in the background now and again, and perhaps as it gets colder, the, by the time this course finishes in December, uh, the Vizlas will be here on the, on the inside, probably make a little more noise. Um, financial advice of advisors. You have to be very careful. There, there's a thing called fiduciary trust that you have in somebody who's making decisions for you. And it's uh, very applicable in finance. Somebody who tends to benefit, that's on commission, um, they probably don't have your best interest at heart. They have, you know, the more they sell, um, you know, the higher their income. So if you're asking somebody who's, who's uh, a bit, whatever, they, they're compromised in that regard, um, you can end up with some, some faulty decisions. So if you get to the point where you're actually hiring a financial advisor, that's, that's the optimum solution. Somebody who's a, like a, you know, working like on a, on a lawyer or an accountant's model where, you know, they're paid directly by you. They, they don't care exactly how much business they get. They, they're paid on the quality of their advice. Uh, that's a little better. Um, and yeah, if you are one of those people, but more often than not, you'll end up working for some commission sales place, trying to get people to buy stuff that may or may not be in their best interest. Components of financial plan. So budgeting, tax planning. So budgeting, you know, where is this money going to go? If I buy this, how is it going to pack things on the future? And what are going to be the tax consequences? Managing your liquidity. Liquidity is another term. Liquidity and opportunity cost are, are two terms that you really will, will know. Liquidity has, has to do with access to cash. You know, you can have somebody who's, say, a millionaire, but can't pay their rent because it's all tied up in investments or tied up wherever. Um, that is a, a problem. So businesses fail all the time. Um, and... I don't know, economies can fail um, if they don't have the liquidity. So it, it has to do with, with quick access to cash. Financing your large purchases, you know. Credit is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, credit cards can be pretty evil, but they can also uh, be useful. But you need to think about credit and, and borrowing money as essentially renting money. And if you can rent it for a cheap rate, then, you know, it's a, it's a good deal. Um, so anyway, we can talk more about that. But not all, when people say, oh, I want to be absolutely debt-free, uh, the wealthy are not debt-free by, by their nature. They, they, they take on huge amounts of debt at, at low price, you know, low rental fees, basically low interest, so that they can... Um, invest it somewhere else to make more money on it. If you notice the stock market, just a kind of a side here, the stock market has it had some pretty big crash. Oh, I guess it's been a couple, three weeks ago now. And what that was based upon was what they call the Japanese carry trade. The Japanese market, you could go over there, if you're a big time, you know, international investor, you could borrow money in Japan for nearly zero interest rate. So a tremendous number of investors had borrowed all this Japanese money and invested it all over the world. And now Japan started to raise their interest rates, which meant that, that you know, there, there was going to be a charge for that borrowed money. And all of a sudden, everybody, you know, they had to basically get back that money, sell their, sell their investments, and, and all that selling... Uh, put downward pressure on the market. I mean, it is infinitesimal. There's a there's a plan out there right now, and again, getting back into politics a little bit to to uh, 
well, it's it's called. Well, we'll we'll deal more with it later. But it but it essentially repriced the entire stock market and caused a crash like we've never seen before. Again, the good news is when you look at like political office, like the president. Yes, they call them the president, but really, they're more the spokesman. <laughs> they, there is so much more to to the government than uh, the the president. Uh, you know, uh, they're 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 more like the PR agent for the for the donors and the other folks that are really pulling pulling the strings behind the scenes. So, it's not the way government's supposed to work, but uh, it, it it's what we've got. So anyway. Protecting your assets and income. So yeah, different types of insurance and different types of even business structures and strategies to keep that. And then invest in your money. Trying to make money with the, with the money you have, have on hand. And then uh, lastly, retirement and estate planning. So retirement has a deal with you still being alive. Estate planning, although there are implications on your life, uh, your estate is what's what's left behind after you aren't. So, so assets are what you own, liabilities are what you owe, and the net worth is the difference. So again, when somebody says they're you know a millionaire, well, just because they have a million dollar house doesn't make them a millionaire. If they if they've got a a million dollar house, but you know, the loan to the bank is $900,000. No, they, they've only truly have $100,000. And maybe they have a little bit more in, in equity if the house is appreciated. But um, it's, you know, if you did that sort of equation here, uh, if the assets that they own would only be $100,000, the liability would be $900,000. So their net worth would be minus a huge number, not a million bucks. So anyway, what you're concerned with um, is, is net worth at the end of the day, if, if that's your goal. Big spenders, big savers. Yep. But again, I wish people, you know, I wish there was like a slash investing because just to put money in the bank, if you put money in the bank in a savings account, yeah, you're you're drowning. You you are you're losing money. Um, inflation eats up the value of that money. If you if you put a hundred dollars in, you know, one of the local banks right now, um, at the end of the year, yeah, you'll probably have uh, maybe a hundred and one dollars, but the buying power will be down in the nineties. Your the buying power, what you're concerned with, what you can do with that money, is is quite a bit different. So, um, anyway, but there, you can look at this, and that's how you can get ahead. I mean, I routinely, because I'm a farmer, I have access to cheaper cheaper land loans, so I can take out loans at at a much reduced rate, you know, three and a half percent or so, when the prevailing rates almost seven so controlling a huge amount of real estate at a low interest rate um, is a good thing inflation it's it's kind of sick but yeah inflation is my friend right now because inflation means that that amount of money I need to pay back is is reduced and 20 30 years from now the amount of money that is remaining will be negligible because you know it's it's just the the whatever i remember when i was growing up my parents had a, a home they were buying a home and the uh, mortgage bill was uh, 133 dollars a month just because the loan was that old you know so it, it just inflation is uh it's not it's not a good thing for the economy but if you structure certain things individually, you can you can hedge against it. Liquidity, so access to funds to cover short-term cash deficiencies, what we talked about before, and money management has to do with how to do this. Don't worry that these there's not going to be uh, you know these definitional type things um, on on the test. The concept of liquidity 
uh, will, will be out there and the concept of opportunity cost will be out there, but it's not going to be, you know, some rote definition. It will be more in context. In credit management, you know, again, the wealthy get wealthy not by using their own money. They get wealthy by using other people's money. So there are there's a bunch of financial people, you know, some of the Dave Ramsey types and other people that want to tell you to be absolutely debt free, and uh, you can do that, <laughs> but. If you can get that money for essentially low, low rates, you know, down around 3% or less, um, you're, you're better off keeping your cash and keeping the loan. So, so having your credit and a good credit score or good access to credit is, is quite valuable. Um, being able to jump on investments when they come around is quite valuable. And being able to have good credit so you don't have to have a ton of cash on hand. Um, you know, people will set up an emergency fund for themselves, and we'll talk a little about that. But uh, you can have a, a much smaller emergency fund of, of cash sitting there essentially doing nothing, not invested. But needs to be there in case something goes wrong. Well, you can minimize that amount of money if you have easy access to credit. So, loans needed for large expenditures, yeah, tuition, cars, houses, managing loans. So, again, the book kind of tends to lump all types of loans together and college tuition you know, it's a, it's a necessary thing. But a car and a mortgage loan, a car or personal loans are not tax deductible. Uh, home loans are tax deductible. So different things. Car loans are can be fairly high interest. Home loans, if they're done right, they can be lower. Or, or at least you get it refinanced when the rates do come down. And then we'll talk about strategies with different loans. We'll talk about the whole finance process. Insurance planning. So certain insurance is a necessity. Liability insurance, meaning if you do something with your vehicle to cause harm to somebody else, um, you need to have that by law. Sometimes uh, if you've got a loan on your vehicle, you'll also have to have a loan to protect the interest of the, uh, of the financer. Same with the home loan. Health insurance, very complex. We'll talk about that. Most health insurance doesn't really fit the definition of insurance. But anyway, and disability and life insurance. Disability insurance is quite hard to get. Life insurance is very much misunderstood. There are certain times in your life when you need life insurance and a lot of times in your life when you absolutely don't need life insurance. So we'll discuss that as well. Plan for your investing. So when you're younger, you have more time to work within, you know, the market and different investments. You can see things kind of go up and down. As people get close to retirement, you know, they get more risk averse justifiably so because if they do lose quite a bit of money um, and have to get out at the bottom they're in trouble um, for most of us you say oh the stock market's going down or Bitcoin dropped today it's like am I selling today <laughs> no so I don't care you know you don't have yourself over leverage to a point where you're forced into must-sell positions and you get out at the bottom. No. When they talk about the stock market crash where it happened in 2007 or, you know, went through 2008, I didn't lose a dime. Most people who were smart did not lose a dime. They just wrote it out. They just didn't sell right then. Don't sell. You have control over that unless you're leveraged, unless you're, you know, using borrowed money. Don't do that. No. Just write it out and within two three years you would have been 
back up to the races and you would have got your 10% return even for those years. You know, on that one year, if you would have sold, you might have lost 20%. But on the next year, when it rebounded, it was up about 30%. So you're still up your 10%. So anyway, don't get yourself overextended to the point where you're in trouble. And so um, volatility, meaning things going up and down fairly violently, is not necessarily a bad thing. And, and learning to, you know, about investments and not panicking and the rest of that, that has, it, it, it will pay you huge dividends later in life and keep you from making insanely bad decisions um, that can definitely affect your future. But investments tolerable at a, at a tolerable level, certainly. Yeah. But there's, again, ways to do that. There's a strategy, I'll, I'll just talk about it right now, especially you see it in crypto. And I know, you know, a lot of people are on crypto and they think, oh man, you're crazy for being involved in it. Crazy in my mind is is using borrowed money, using leverage, using using borrowed money to make investments. Where now you're at a set timeline when you need to pay that money back. Um, I've rode crypto up, I've rode it down, I've sold at the top, I've never ever sold at the bottom, nor do I ever plan to. You don't have to. Um, anyway, crypto is a unique thing because it kind of goes on a four-year cycle. And so you, you can forecast these dips. Um, plan for your retirement in the state. So, yep, retirements, it's very hard to figure this out because you don't know how long you're going to live. And the last thing you want to do is run out of money. I mean, ideally, if you had a perfect plan in life, you know, that, that check to the funeral home would bounce. You would leave, you know, a... A horrible looking body and, and no money in the account but most people don't have that kind of planning you know understandably estate planning not a bad thing and and estate planning means that you control where where your wealth is going to go upon your death um, and like they say it can be distributed before so you have some you know peace of mind that it's not just all going to be ate up or go to causes that you don't think are, are valuable. Yep, enhance your net worth, build your wealth, and everything affects it. So anyway, this is just sort of a very broad overview. We'll get more into specifics in, in following weeks. Um, you know, we'll look at some of the items. You'll see that a lot of times the slides, uh, some of these slides are pre painted some some I've added myself, but they don't always follow the the exact numbers because we're not going to talk about thirteen slides of <laughs> how things affect your cash flow. Uh, we can be a little bit more succinct on that. This is for setting up basically a budget inflows outflows. You've got all sorts of different apps out there. We'll talk about a few of them if those are helpful for you. Um, the best thing is just being disciplined in your spending, keeping track of things. If you need a budget to do it, then by all means. But uh, for most people, it might be more time consuming than it's worth. Yep. More budgeting decisions. So, I mean, it's good to have a, an overview in terms of, I mean, I've seen people where they actually do this day by day and they have a little ledger or now they, I guess, do it on their smartphone, iPhone, whatever. But it's, you know, I don't quite have enough time for, for that or it's not, not a priority for me. Liquidity. So liquidity is key. Having enough money to meet your current obligations is quite important. Or at least having access to credit, you know. And people, probably worldwide, but especially in the United States, they do quite poorly at this. You know, there's always these questions. Could you come up with 800 bucks overnight? And most people, no. You know, 
Good news is most situations don't require cash payments. You know, if you have access to credit cards or something else, you can use that credit card and then pay it off within the month. You're a convenience user and it's the same as if you had paid cash. So you can get around it, but. So again, it starts out with your job. That's the amount of income that's gonna be coming in. But once you have it, you make those decisions and um, in terms of what you're left with. Leasing a car, generally not. Kind of a come on. Uh, not necessarily good for you, good for the person leasing the car. Borrow money to purchase a car. If it's incentivized, typically. Uh, borrow money to purchase home, just about always, because there's tax benefits to doing it. Plus, you want to get in the market as soon as possible. If that is your intent to, to buy a home, by sitting on the sidelines, you're put at a disadvantage, and the, and the home prices will basically inflate away from you. Anyway, we'll try and answer these questions as we as we go through. We'll spend a whole a whole chapter on on home buying and some of the ins and outs on that. It looks like I did keep all these slides. Whatever. We'll just buzz through them. So again, insurance, you know, you if you do become sort of a high wealth kind of person, you'll probably want some um, overall umbrella liability program. But the, the problem with, with insurance in terms of personal finance, there's a lot of programs out there that, that label themselves as personal finance and investments that are managed by insurance companies. And that's not going to be the best strategy in most cases for you to to uh, to prosper. Typically, you want to keep your insurance and your investments completely separate. Insurance companies work on a very commission-driven model where investments, uh, because of competitive pressures, typically are commission-free. So, plus, insurance companies don't they, they because they're the nature of the business they're usually far too conservative of investments. They don't appreciate at the same level that a, that a thriving market can. Like I say, you have complete control over when, when you buy and sell investments. So volatility uh, can definitely be your friend. But insurance companies, they, they will, you know, risk and reward have a definite relationship. There's a correlation there. And if you take no risk, you will get very little reward. And if your reward is not above inflation, the rate of inflation, then you're actually losing money. So that's the problem with most insurance investments. Personal investing. And we'll address that as well. So it's all tied in, it's all interrelated. And then retirement. So there's tax advantages for uh, retirement investments. There's also employer programs to encourage retirement investing. Uh, a lot of times this is done in the form of a match, whereas Let's say you're getting paid 100 grand by a company, and they've got, you know, some sort of 10% investment retirement strategy, meaning that you you put up 4% and they'll put up 6%. They'll match your retirement. Well, they'll more than match. You put up 4%, so you basically put up 4% of your income, and they'll put 6,000 towards your retirement. If you can do that, well, you should do that. You pretty much have to do that if you've got any sense about you. So 
your, your co-worker who chooses not to do that, who doesn't invest, well, they're essentially working for $6,000 less a year than you are, you know, just through their own buffoonery and their, so anyway, you'll end up with, with retirement investments, but there's all sorts of ways to use retirement investments. When I showed you that initial thing with, you know, the big chunk of property, I bought uh, I bought 65 acres up by Chickaloon with a retirement investment, and I bought oh, another 40 acres out here on the Knick with a retirement. It was held in a trust. And uh, anyway, it, it was still my retirement account. Per the IRS, I could not enjoy any personal benefit from it, meaning I couldn't put a house on it. But I could go out there and hunt on it and enjoy my other properties. My horses and dogs could enjoy it. The pigs were out there grazing on it. And even if you wanted to do it in a business, you could. It would just be those finances would have to be kept separate. But there's, there's, and then a lot of times for, for business loans, people think, oh, when you need a loan, you just go to a bank. Well, first off, banks don't necessarily, their personal loans are quite expensive typically. And um, for a business proposition, they're very reluctant to do that. But if you have funds in your retirement, you can take a loan against your, your own retirement account and pay it back to yourself. And there's not even an application involved. You just do it. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about it that as we go. But just because it's in a retirement account doesn't mean that it can't help you out in your everyday working life. And cash flows from investments. Anyway, so what I've been saying about it being integrated is exactly true. Yep. Here's another thing about, you know, trying to get more cash. Some of these things, you know, attempt to work more hours, withdraw cash. These are all short-term solutions. Obtain a loan, you're already in debt. You can't make, fine. how are you going to pay for a loan as well? Cash and insurance policy. That might address why you're having these financial problems because if you've got an insurance policy that's got a cash value, you've probably got sold an insurance policy that was not very beneficial to you. I don't have any cash policies or insurance policies that have a cash value. That's a different type of product. That's a whole life, universal life, something like that. For most people, insurance policies that you should have are term policies that have no cash value. So anyway, sell some of your investments. Again, you're, you're in kind of crisis mode here. Withdraw from a retirement account, that's going to involve um, penalties. If you're before 59 and a half, you'll have to pay 10% plus a few other things. So the best way to do this is is have a bit of a nest egg set aside and make loans, you know, out of your investment accounts to yourself, get through that hardship, and then move on. Yep. Okay. So yeah, most of the lectures will not be this slide intensive. Like I said, we weren't going to do all 13 of those slides and go figure I ran through every single one. Um, typically, that's not the way the, the course will go. Um, it'll be more discussion oriented or relying on some of the videos and stuff. So budgeting decisions affect your liquidity. So budgeting affects the amount of cash that's available. So. The way they're using insurance in a broader term for me, insurance is, is you know, I buy the necessity that's involved. Um, it depends, you know, if you're if you're somebody who, who thinks you need life insurance in college, unless you have children or somebody relying upon you, you absolutely do not. Or if you're somebody who's older, whose kids have gone away, you don't need life insurance again. You should structure your investments where that money that you would have been putting into insurance is worth so much more than that insurance company was going to pay. But if you're somebody who's like in their 30s, you've got children, 
you've got a house that's with a mortgage, you've got people dependent upon you, you need lots of insurance, but you need it for a certain length of time. And then when you don't need it, you don't want to be paying for it any longer. So we'll, we'll talk more about insurance, but I think they do you a disservice by confusing insurance and investments. All righty. And then lastly, you know, the psychology of this stuff. Some people, they, they don't want to think about finances or they, they want to obsess about it or they, they watch it on a daily basis and when the market drops, they sell at the bottom and other people just completely ignore it and make you know, the same sorts of foolish, foolish decisions. You need to have, learn some skills, learn, especially in terms of purchasing you know, identify needs versus wants and not get yourself in over your head and, and look at the long term and, uh, you know, focus on the future, as they say. Yeah. This can be very difficult, though, when you're in a relationship and the person is on the other side of the fence. The one person wants to go spend or the one person, you know, they... they it's, it's like retail therapy where they go to Target or whatever. They blow a ton of money on clutter <laughs> and bring home a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, whatever. My personal life's kind of creeping in here. But, you know, you just have to look at a big pile of stuff and go, was, was my life, it was my, you know, the benefit there? Or would I rather have that money? I don't know. Yeah, some people living paycheck to paycheck and spending all your income. You know, the solution to this is paying yourself first. If you, if you, you know, say I need to put away, my goal is to put away 10% of my income in the savings, do it. Do it on day one and then spend like you want. Live broke for the rest of the month. Doesn't matter, you know. If it's there in your, in your checking account and your investment goals are already met, then... Spend guilt-free. Don't worry about it. But if you're going to save whatever's left, well, guess what? There's not going to be anything left. You're going to find reasons where all that money is, is gone. And finally, finally getting on to the homework of it. So there's going to be a couple problems in the book. This is the Maduro book. Don't be fooled. You don't have to buy any extra things. You you shouldn't need any codes or anything. And I certainly, they never give me any codes. It really frustrates me with the, with the publisher or the bookstore says, oh, the instructor's got the codes. I have no codes. I, I, they, they don't furnish me anything. It's, it's uh, anyway, there's all sorts of IT problems that can occur uh, with some sorts of the electronic book delivery, but they can be worked out, but I'm not in the loop. Uh, on those. I mean, sometimes I get in the loop to call up the publisher and, you know, force them to do what they are paid for, but I, they never have ever provided me a code. So again, homework not turned in on a weekly basis, turn in as batch assignments. Those, uh, look at those spreadsheets, see if you can decipher, you know, what, what amount of money would be put aside. And, uh, just complete it and then put it aside and then later on we'll turn it as one big batch assignment so that's about it so anyway i didn't mean to go on quite that long but but that's going to be the uh what we're going to be looking at in this course again welcome let me know if you have any questions um don't worry about the different editions of the book uh, we'll we'll try and make it right with with the questions that come to a common ground sometimes you know, your question, whatever, will be slightly different than the other edition. But rather than insist on everybody buys the newest book, it's kind of a waste of time and money. So we'll, we'll, we'll work around that. I've got a fairly large aperture on that. So sounds good. Till next week.